Hi, I'm Dr. David Lee, and I'm the director of the Cardiac Catheterization Lab at Stanford University. It's my great pleasure today to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Fioran, who's the director of interventional cardiology at Stanford. And today we're going to talk about aortic valve disease and specifically aortic stenosis. Thanks, David. Bill, tell us a little bit more about aortic stenosis and why is it important? Yeah, so aortic stenosis uh, refers to narrowing of one of the valves in the heart, the aortic valve. It's one of the four valves, and it's the valve that is supposed to open when the heart pumps and allow blood to leave the left ventricle and, and go out the aorta to the rest of the body. And then the leaflets close uh, and prevent blood from leaking back into the heart. Um, aortic stenosis refers to when those leaflets, instead of opening and closing uh, widely, they are thickened and narrowed and don't open well. And that leads to increased pressure in the heart, and it can lead to build up a pressure in the lungs and make people feel short of breath. Sometimes they can have chest pain. Sometimes not enough blood gets to their head and they get lightheaded and dizzy. And aortic stenosis is a, a significant problem. 5% um, or more of patients over 75 have uh, significant aortic stenosis. And so um, it, it, it's uh, something that we deal with on a very common basis. Now, things have changed in terms of how we treat this over the years. T tell me a little bit more about the options now for treating aortic stenosis. Right. So. Aortic stenosis is one of those problems that there's not really any good medical therapy. Um, it's a mechanical problem and you have to fix it by removing the valve or replacing uh, the valve. And uh, traditionally that had meant doing open heart surgery um, to remove the old valve and sew in a new one. And that means you know being hospitalized usually for five to seven days and it sometimes takes you know two to uh, three months uh, to recover completely from that. Um, and their inherent risks, as you can imagine. So about um, 12 years ago at Stanford, uh, we started doing what's called transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And that refers to um, replacing the valve by going using a catheter um, through the groin, uh, or um, well, the femoral artery in the groin. And uh, basically, um, what it means is that patient doesn't have to have a sternotomy or have to have their breastbone uh, cracked, and they don't have to have general anesthesia, and, and their hospitalization is much shorter. So, so you don't have to go to the operating room for aortic stenosis? No, we typically do it in the catheterization laboratory uh, in conjunction with our cardiac surgeons. It's a team effort, um, and also with anesthesiologists. Um, and uh, what happens is the patient is awake but very sleepy, uh, so they're comfortable, and we insert a, a tube or catheter in the femoral artery in the groin, and through that we're able to run the new valve. And um, the, the valve, it's uh, like a cylinder of chicken wire mm -hmm. uh, or a stent, and uh, basically we advance that up the aorta and across uh, the narrowed valve. And um, once we're happy with the positioning, then we deploy it. Um, and basically, that's usually by inflating a balloon or retracting a sheath uh, for the self-expanding ones. And it, uh, the new valve is it's like a stent, as I said. It, it pushes up the old leaflets and creates room for blood to leave the heart. And sewn on, uh, on the inside of that stent are new leaflets that come from part of a cow's heart or pig's heart. And they start opening and closing right away. Um, we never have to stop the patient's heart uh, during the procedure. Uh, and once we're happy with the position and function of the valve, then we remove our equipment and put a little suture in the groin and the procedure's over. What, 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 should, what would the patient uh, expect, you know, in terms of their state? And we know traditional surgery, uh, their chest is open, they have to cl be closed up afterwards. Oftentimes they're in the hospital for a week um, or potentially longer. Um, how does TAVR fit uh, yeah. in, that, in that scheme? So typically, uh, the patient comes into the hospital in the morning, um, and we uh, do the procedure. It takes about an hour, um, you know, from setup time to the patient leaving the room. The actual time we're working is even shorter than that. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the patient's awake during the procedure, but sleepy. So then they go to the recovery room, and they usually spend a little while, maybe an hour there, recovering, monitoring the heart rate and blood pressure. And then they'll go to the regular hospital ward, and they'll spend the night in the hospital. And then typically, as long as they're feeling okay and comfortable with the plan, they'll go home the next day. Wow, so overnight. 
Yep. And wow, then that's great. they, um, you know, because they've had catheters in the uh, arteries in the leg, we ask them to um, take it easy for about a week, meaning mm -hmm. they can do regular walking and going up and down stairs and things like that. But we don't want them lifting anything heavy or riding a bike or doing something that might put strain onto the artery. So, so what patients with aortic stenosis are actually eligible for TAVR? Is it everybody? Yeah, so it's really interesting. You know, um, initially when we first started doing this, the uh, paradigm was that everyone was a surgical candidate and only if they weren't a surgical candidate, then you would consider TAVR. And because of some of the data that has been generated um, over the past decade, um, we now have switched things and everyone is considered a TAVR candidate. Uh, and then if there's some reason why TAVR is not feasible or we think um, you wouldn't have as good a result as we'd like in it, then we consider surgery. Do, do patients ask you when they're considering TAVR versus open heart surgery and the valve replacement, um, how, how long do the valves last compared to a surgical valve, for instance? Yeah, so that is a great question, and it's still a little bit of an unknown. Um, part of the reason is, although you know at Stanford we've been doing it for 12 years, um, initially most of the patients were very elderly, and they would end up passing away from some other cause without knowing, you know, their valve was still functioning fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't really have long-term data. The other issue is that the valves have changed, and so the newest generation of valves that we're using have been around for three or four years. Now, we do have some studies of um, comparisons where patients were randomly assigned, half got traditional surgery um, and half got a TAVR valve, and out to five years, both valves seem to be functioning equally well. And we know that the surgical valves in general last 10 to 15 years. And so we're hopeful that it's the same for the TAVR mm -hmm. valves, but that's something that we need to continue to gain more, you know, more data and information on. And what, what if the patient doesn't have a lot of symptoms? That is, may, and this is not that uncommon, as you know. Um, a patient may have severe aortic stenosis, but very little in terms of symptoms. Are, are they also eligible or, or do we still wait until people have symptoms till we treat yeah, them? Yeah, it's a great question and we, um, Traditionally, we would always wait because treatment meant having open heart surgery, and you mm -hmm. kind of wanted to put that off until you absolutely had to go through, go, go forward with it. But there are data now to suggest that even in asymptomatic patients, um, and I should mention that many people can have severe aortic stenosis and live for you know, years without developing symptoms. But there are data now that suggests that the heart may not like that, as you can mm -hmm. imagine, and that there may be changes in the heart muscle and function that um, uh, are bad and that, you know, treating the valve sooner would be better even if the patient's not having symptoms. And so we're uh, part of an investigation or trial looking at this um, called early TAVR, and it's including patients with severe aortic stenosis without symptoms and um, they get randomized to either an upfront TAVR procedure or to the standard of care, which is again, close monitoring. And then when they develop symptoms, uh, we do TAVR. Are there any new devices that are coming into play or to make the procedure even safer than what it is now? Yes, yeah, so there are some devices um, that are already available and others that are being tested. Uh, for example, something called cerebral protection. It's a device where uh, up th we advance a catheter through the arm and it um, allows us to uh, block uh, any debris from going up and potentially causing a stroke. Um, and there are new valves that are being developed as well. And um, uh, particularly, you know, for one issue that um, we pretty commonly face, especially in younger patients, something called bicuspid aortic mm -hmm. stenosis. And so these patients were born with a malformed valve and they haven't been as well studied with TAVR. And um, there are some differences in their valve morphology that might be amenable to, you know, or might be better suited for a, a new technology. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. Thank you.